1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 49 and 50. <laughs> you got to pray for me. I had a lot of information in the adult class. And I'm not going to probably get through this message uh, because I really went uh, deep in studying for myself. And when that happens, I apologize if I just go right over your head. I'm praying the Lord will not allow that to happen. <clears throat> And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. It's going to be different than probably you've ever heard on David and Goliath, but I want to minister under the help of the Lord the one giant David missed. The one giant David missed. Hmm. Can we pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts? Lord, we need you today. God, you've laid this upon my heart. God, we've had a wonderful time in your word already in, in dealing with our heart. Today, Lord, we want to ask that you administer through your word. Speak to us today. We pray, God, that there would be giant killers in this room. And God, that, that we would step up, Lord, to the call of your spirit, Lord. There are things that are unseen that need to be dealt with, God. We pray, help us to stand against those giants, Lord, and help us to be bold to do your will. And we pray, Lord, that you, against every spirit that would try to hinder, we rebuke it in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray your word would have its way through us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to ask you all to just say this with me. God, give me revelation. Amen. You may be seated. I, I am very... I'm a very biblical-based preacher. One time, when I was in North Platte, one of the largest churches in the town uh, saw one of the people that was now coming to our church and said, oh, you're, you're a part of that church who preaches the Bible. <laughs> well, what are they preaching? That's what I want to know. And that was the pastor saying that one of those Bible preachers that Pastor Patterson is. I'm like, what's, where's he getting his messages from? And, and literally, when you study the Bible, there are fascinating things that honestly, we, we kind of just go over. When we hear about giants, for most of you who are newer, you think David and Goliath is the, the giant that David slew. But I want to go into... Uh, a little history about the giants that you might not know. Prior to the great flood, it is recorded that there were giants which were known as Nephilim. And at first glance, when you look at the Bible and read through it, it seems that, that there's some mentions of giants, but in reality, those nations were classified rather than just a giant here or there. The nations were classified as uh, as, a, as a people who were giants. They were nations of giants, and they're mentioned multiple times. For instance, the Amorites are giants, and they are mentioned more than 80 times in the Old Testament. Genesis 6 and 4, prior to the flood, there were giants in the earth in those days. Let me, let me help somebody right now. This is not somebody who is big like they are today. Could you turn down my monitors just a hair? I don't want to have feedback. Thank you, brother. They, they're not the same kind of giants. So take out your old humanistic thinking and think through the Bible. Can we do that? Can we put on our Bible thinking caps? It says that, this, it, that there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of men came into the, our sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children unto them. And the same became mighty, which were of old, men of renown. And this scripture is talking about prior to the flood. And we know that everything was destroyed with the flood. 
even the giants prior to the flood. They were destroyed in the flood. Genesis tells us that because God's judgment, the whole human population in Genesis 7, perished except for eight people, that's Noah and his family. After the flood, there are several accounts of giants in the land still. Multiple mentions of those races, which were, dis- which were generations after Noah's son, Ham. Noah's grandson, Canaan, son of Ham, would be, uh, would be, uh, was the believed lineage through which the giants would come. We do know that after Ham revealed and mocked his father's nakedness in Genesis 9 and 25, that that Noah said, cursed be, God said, cursed be Canaan, and that from Canaan would be that place, that same land, that by, by name the inhabitants would be giants, and that we would hear about them over and over and over as the Canaanites. The Ammon, as I said, the Amorites mentioned more than 80 times in scriptures, and yet it was, uh, it was I, scripture, Amos chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars. Uh, Shaq would be a little pimple to these people. Okay? You don't say those kind of things unless these people are big. And it says, he was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also, it was I who brought up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. God is saying, I'm the one who defeats the giants. The Amorites were one of the groups that they saw and they claimed all the people that we saw in the land are men of great stature. Numbers chapter 13 and 32. It is telling that in their response, Joshua and Caleb did not find a a challenge of the size of the inhabitants of that land. They They were the only ones that said, come on, we can take it. But they recognized that there were giants in the promised land. An Egyptian document called the Craft of the Scribe, a historical document, placed the Anakim, or the Amalekites, between six foot ten inches and eight foot seven. That's not the Bible, that's the Egyptians saying that. You see, all this stuff with Greek culture and, and the Greek myths and the mythical gods and all this stuff about uh, these giants that they come up, it actually originated from the Bible. There were actually giants back then. So crazy. I, I, I came, I was down south, my daughter said, you know, most of the people down here don't believe that there's dinosaurs, that they're just a lie from the devil. The devil planted the bones. What? What are you talking about? But you know what? There are people that don't believe there were giants. Deuteronomy 2, 10 and 11 reveals the the emin, which which by definition means terrors. These were giants. The emin had dwelt in times past as a people, as a great and numerous and as tall as the anakims. The ones we just mentioned. But the Moabites called them Emim. There's also the the Zuzim, which if you read it in your Bible, is the Zamzumim people. I'm thankful that they're eradicated because I cannot say that many times. They were called giants as listed in the same chapter as the Emim. The land of Ammon was also regarded as a land of giants. These, the, these giants formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people of, uh, as great and as numerous and as tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before them and they dispossessed them and dwelt in their place according to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Now, I want to make sure you understand, it's not God just eradicate. God's using people to bring forth his purpose to get rid of the giants. 
It says that they lived, this verse in, in uh, chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 19 and 38 says that the giants known as the Zamzumimim had lived in the land of Ammon, a land of giants, and God destroyed those Zamzumimim so that the descendants of Lot's son ben Ami, which is the Amorites or Ammonites, could live in the land according to Genesis 6 and 38. Then there's giants known as the Rephim. The third chapter of Deuteronomy contains an interesting account of the victory of the Israelites over Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. There are those of you that probably need to look this up. It's Deuteronomy chapter 3 and 11. If you just throw that scripture up there, is, the, is a pretty interesting account. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained in the remnants of the giants. In other words, they're getting eradicated. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. That's his headboard. And it says, is it not in Rabath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits were the length of his bed, four cubits the breadth of it after the cubit of a man. And everybody says, wow, that's a lot of cubits. But when you look at the actual height of this, the standard of a cubit is, according to historians, 18 inches. Og, uh, King Og would have been would have had a bed, or some believe it's interpreted coffin, of about 13.5 feet long. Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary has his bed at 19 feet long, according to historical accounts of the cubit that were different than those of Egypt. And six feet wide. So these are real giants. To put this into perspective, if, if, I was, uh, if, if the bed was stood up on end and the height of the, the bed would be uh, almost three times as tall as I am, uh, if you took a person that's six foot nine inches, let's use the smaller amount, six foot nine inches would be about this on me, and you doubled that, that would be as the height of King Og. This king of Bashan. People downplay the size, but the Bible clearly states that it was a giant. When it says giant, that's interpreted, interpreted big person. Really gigantic person. Joshua 13 and 12, the kingdom of Og in Bashan, which reigneth in Ashtaroth in, and in Edrei, the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite cast and cast them out. It was Moses that went in and started cleaning house at first. So you remember the account of the 12 spies that went into the land of Canaan by Moses? The spies returned and said uh, this in Numbers chapter 13, 32, and 33. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land... Though through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and the, all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. Everybody say giant. And we saw, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. So if you can imagine the sons of Anak looking and say, eh, don't worry about them little people. It's likely they were our size, but these giants were different. The Anakim, as mentioned in this passage, both Im, uh, the Imen and the Zumzam, uh, Zam, Zam, Zamzumimim were compared to Anakim, and they are mentioned as people and numerous as tall in Deuteronomy chapter 2, Joshua routed them out and defeated them in Joshua 11, 21, and 22. Have I lost? Are you guys okay? A lot of information here. Try studying it. There was even a mention of an Egyptian giant. 
First Chronicles 11.23 talks about one of David's mighty men, Benaniah, the son of Jeho- Je- Jehoiada, defeated a large Egyptian man. He killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall, and they say that's between seven foot five and eight feet tall. In the Egyptian's hand, there was a spear like a weaver's beam, and he went down to him with a staff, uh, uh, rested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. Anybody believe the Bible? You still with me? So let's take a quick history or an inventory of how these giants came about. Ham's descendants and their influence. Nimrod is the first post flood giant, and he's noted as Nephilim. Nimrod founded the ancient city of Nineveh and the Babylonian kingdom. Mizraim is the forefather of the Philistines, from whom came the famous giant Goliath, who was defeated by David. Canaan is the forefather of the Canaanites, whose wickedness brought God to use Israel to punish and largely destroy. And the Canaanites appear to have been the original builders of Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked cities of God that, that God destroyed during Abraham's lifetime. Sounds like a bunch of troublemakers. Most of the post-flood biblical reference to the giants were Canaanites, but they, all of them, no matter what their name w- was, were descendants of Ham. So this is where it takes us to where we're at. Everybody okay? I think, I think if we, by the time we're done, we need to be all giant killers in here. You need to recognize who you are in Jesus Christ. You're a giant killer. You're not just insignificant in the kingdom of God. If you'll just recognize who you are, you can do anything through Jesus Christ. You have the power of God in your life. These men couldn't, even though they're called mighty men and valiant men, they could not have done it in their own power. In their own power, they couldn't have done it. This brings us to the opening passage, the story of of Samson, uh, uh, of, of Samson. Thank you. It's not Samson. David and Goliath. That's the other message. I'm looking around thinking, what am I saying? First Samuel chapter 17, 3 through 7. The Philistines stood on one mountain on one side. Israel stood on the mountains on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Here's Goliath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Ooh. Nine foot nine inches. Nine foot nine inches. Are are you catching me? That's a big dude. I don't know if these are nine foot, are these common eight foot walls? Add another foot on. Nine foot nine inches was Goliath. That is a pretty good champion to pick on. Hey, let's go ahead and defeat these Israelites. Let's pick the nine foot nine guy. And he had a helmet of brass on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. That's a guard. Uh, just, oh, don't get too deep. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. Beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. He had so much on him, he had to have someone else carry his shield. So just to give you the understanding of the armaments that were so big with him, his coat of mail translates into about 125 pounds of that, that garment, that metal garment covering him that he was carrying for, to guard his chest. His spear of his tip alone was 15 to 17 pounds. 
a group that I found studied the size, and of course, they're smarter than I. They were, they're, they're historians, but also engineers, and they figured out the d- diameter of the weaver's beam because of the tip, and they came up with this measurement as the weapon as if, so that it would work in their day to do its job. It says, for physics, our Goliath spear beam to work properly with a 16-pound, pound, they called it a 16-pound head, so uh, just in between 15 and 16 or 15 to 17, as I mentioned, the spearhead and the height of Goliath, we chose a 10-foot length, 2-inch diameter pole, including a 6-pound, 1.2-ounce counterweight, giving our spear total length of 12 foot 7 inches, but the spear could have been longer. Isn't that nice to know? I don't know about you, but if someone's throwing a spear that big from somewhere, I'm dead. I'm done. It's, you're done. You're, you're just shish kebab. That's it. This doesn't even take into the account of his helmet, his armor on his legs, his javelin, or his sword. It, it, you look at all this stuff and you're like, how in the world? And here they are. Let's face off. Let's have an MMA bout, bout with, a, with a death sentence. Bring out your best, Israel. We got nine foot nine Goliath coming at you. It continues in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And they give him a boy eventually. Isn't that an insult to a giant? When Saul heard, of all, heard and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Duh. They're hiding. And as I was studying this, I thought, Surely Saul would have the record of Moses' Joshua and other records of success in defeating these giants. Not only that, when, he, when, he, when his kingdom fell, he went and destroyed a nation of giants and brought back their king in disobedience to God. Verses 33 says, Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went after him, smote him, delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, smote him, and slew him. You cannot do that in your natural flesh. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, but and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. No wonder David was a man of faith. He's just a young man. He's just a boy. I know we show him as a little boy. He had to be somewhere around 17. But he was actually full of faith. How can you defy God and live? Notice how he says this uncircumcised Philistine like it really matters. Goliath and this thing of circumcision, uncircumcision means he was without covenant. Oh, when you came to God and you were born again of the water and the spirit, you didn't come to church to be a part of a church. You came to be a part of a covenant relationship with Jesus. You're a covenant part of this relationship. That changes the authority you stand under. And he says, who is this one that doesn't have a covenant? As big as he was, he didn't have a covenant. And David saw the power that he had through covenant. David said, moreover, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, I will go. I'm a man. No. Go, Lord be with you. Don't don't show me. Verse 44 says, The Philistine came to David, said, uh, he, he, he said to David, Come to me, I will give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thy hast Thou hast defied. You come against God, you're coming against me. 
<laughs> you, you don't understand. We are apostolic Christians. They're not just dealing with somebody who's just going to change in a moment's notice because we have a little bit of emotional change in our life. We are apostolic Christians. We stand in the name of Jesus. We are steadfast, immovable, ever abounding in the work of the Lord. We are the children of the Most High God. When these things happen, if you're an apostolic Christian, something needs to rise up in you and say, no, no, you ain't taking my ground. This is God's ground. No, you're not going to take my child. This is God. He's on my side. Hmm. Notice that the Philistine's looking at him like, this is the best that they have? Notice what David says in his boldness, verse 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He didn't think he could win. He knew he would win. Why do we face battles as if God is not with us? Verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted, ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He wasn't just looking at the Philistine. He was running right at him. He knew behind him is going to have to be defeated too. And David put his hand in his bag, took thence a stone, and he slang it. Oh, just a stone? Just a stone? What's up with that? Man, when I was a kid, we played baseball, and you did not have a guard on your jaw. You didn't have a face mask like a football game. You surely didn't wear chest protection on the mound. And now you watch little kids play baseball, they are, they're dressed for defense. Because a ball might hit them in a vulnerable area. Not the bat, not the opposing team, a ball. So he takes that sling, the very thing he had mastered being a shepherd boy, and he says, and he took that stone, slang it, smote the Philistine in the forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Well, that was hard. You know, the devil has more talk. He's trying to talk you down from living for God before you ever make a dent in his head. He's trying to stop you and use his words to cut you down before you ever stand and say, I am not moving. I am a child of God. Is there any giant slayers in the room? You're saying, God, I am more than a conqueror. Verse 50, it says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Remember he said, I'm not going to use a sword. I'm sure in all of Goliath's training, he never figured, hey, I've got to guard myself against a little stone. I don't know if he was cross-eyed as it approached. I have no idea. All I know is, done. It says, it says, and it keeps saying it too. There was no sword in the hand of David. Verse 51, so Therefore David ran, stood upon the Philistine. Can you imagine standing on a nine-foot-nine body? Took out his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof. He's talking about the Philistine sword. Again, this is a young man. He's taking a giant sword. You cannot do that under your own strength. Slew him, cut off his head therewith, and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. They're like, we're out of here. 
I say it again, Isaiah 54 and 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You may see weapons formed, but they will not prosper. You'll see giants that have all the armor and the, and the training, but that doesn't mean they're going to win. Or else the scriptures say, you'll never see a weapon formed against you. He said, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Daniel eleven thirty two, And such do as wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt, corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God. Why does this church say, build a relationship? Build a relationship. Get intimacy with Jesus. Get close to the Lord. Know him better. Pray like you've never prayed before. They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Oh, hallelujah. We've got to get to know our God better. He never loses. So if you lose, it may be because you really weren't where you needed to be in the first place. No wonder Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things. All things. All things. I, I, I can take a, a, a giant sword and use it because I can do all things. Somebody needs to start waking up to what you have inside of you. The Bible talks about it as a treasure. You don't even know all that God is investing in you. You're just going through life and you're missing how much God is using you and loving you and trying to, trying to grow close to you. Acts 13, 22, it says, And when he had removed him, he, they, he raised up David to be their king, whom, uh, to whom also gave, he gave testimony. He said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill my will. It was David that went later on in, 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 in his 20s into a place of stepping into kingship. He was the next king. Anybody ever thought about that? A man after my own heart. One man. There's a rabbi, Rabbi Prouser says it like this. He looked for a man after his own heart. What was he looking for? A man who searches after God's desire and God's will. Most of the time he puts God's desire above his own. And even in those moments when he does not, God allows for forgiveness. God still says this is a man after his own heart, which means God doesn't allow our humanity to be held against us. And I started out with all these things with the title, The One Giant That David Missed. The One Giant That David Missed. 2 Samuel chapter 11. He's king. He's been defeating giants left and right. It says it came to pass after the year was expired that the time of the kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab his servants with him and all, with him and all, all Israel and destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. The first time he didn't go back into battle. He stayed at home. And it came to pass in at eventide that David arose off his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman and, and said, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned into her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David, said, I am with child. And David sent Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was coming to him, David demanded of, of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So he's keeping Uriah from what's happening. The t They're supposed to be at war. Your greatest problem is when you're doing nothing. Your, pray, your greatest, my greatest, your greatest problem is when we are idle, when God's calling us to move. 
Oh, we can be busy in life. We can be busy all day long. But idle concerning the things that God is calling us to do. And we get into trouble when we get into that mindset. David, with all of his, his, his giants he slew, all the things, all the victories, he came back from battle and women were crying out his name on how great David was. But when he became idle, he goes and steals another man's wife. Wait a minute, this is David, a man after God's own heart. How? How? He continues in 6 and 7, and it came to pass when David, uh, <clears throat> I just mentioned what I was going to talk about. They came back from slaughtered Philistines that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing and meeting to meet King Saul with tabrets and joys and instruments and music. And the, woman, the women answered one another as they played, said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. There are, were more victories during the time of David than any other period in the times of the kings. Who are they fighting? A lot of giants. You see, you can go out and do all those things that make you who you need to be. And you can come to church and you can have good church. But if you're not taking care of the giants in your life, you're in trouble. So easy to fight for everyone else. But when you get at home and no one's around, there's one giant you didn't kill. There's one giant David didn't slay. The giant was his own flesh. He was just a normal man compared to all the other giants, but he failed to recognize the, the, the giant that was in his life that he didn't destroy. And nowadays, we've got to realize and recognize this and come before God humbly, asking Him to minister in our hearts uh, to take care of the giant that can destroy us. There's a fleshly man. There's a fleshly side to each one of us. And if we're not paying attention, it will come, uh, come into, our, into our midst and it will come and start leading us away from where we need to be in God and destroying what God is trying to do. You see, David got a big head when he fell into sin. He ended up taking her husband, sending him, sending him to the front lines and allowing him to be killed so that he could have Uriah's wife. Man after God's own heart. How? But when he was approached by the prophet, and the prophet called him for his sin, he didn't stand up and say, you're lying. That is wrong. Do you know what he did? It's just like our adult lesson that we had earlier. He said, it's my heart. And God, I'm sorry. I've done evil. I've done wrong. He broke half the commandments with his sin with Beersheba because he failed to look at the giant in his own backyard. How many will agree with me? It's easier to pray for someone else than yourself, doesn't it? It's also easy to fight for someone else who has a giant in their life than take care of your own. I asked just so we, when we get excited about the giants, I asked how many people are giant killers, how many, how many are, are giant slayers, how many, everybody, oh, yeah. now we're talking about ourselves, we're like, oh, you're talking about my life. In today's world, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't deal with things like they did in Israel. But we've got to take care of the things we don't see in our lives. And we've got, there's, got to be some, there's got to be some daddies that will stand up for their children and pray for them in the Spirit to, that God would protect their children. There's got to be some husbands that will pray for their wives and ask God and plead the blood, the blood of Jesus upon them, asking God to anoint their minds and help them. 
It's got to be some women that will pray for their children, their husbands, that will say, God, he needs to be used by you. Anoint him. Touch him where he's at. Because the only way you're a giant killer in today's church is if you know how to pray. And when the time calls for God to ask you to stand and fight a giant for someone else's behalf, you'll be able to stand with some, some battle wounds saying, you know what? The toughest giant, I took care of him at home. And you'll be able to help someone else. You know what? I went through that and I defeated it. I know I'm still living. I'm still flesh. But I've been through it. You can make it. But King Saul wouldn't go onto the battlefield where a boy would go because King Saul was not really a man of God at that point. And I'm calling for people to, that'll say, yeah, you know what, Pastor, I'm going to stand and I'm going to be the, 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 the man or the woman that you called me to be. No longer am I going to cower behind someone else in the church. No longer am I going to just allow myself to be in a position where everybody else has got to fight. And somehow I'm going to just conceal where I'm at. I'm telling you, 2023 is going to be a time that we're going to be able to stand up and fight and take territory for the name of Jesus Christ. And you know who's going to do it? Those who know how to defeat the giants that are in their own home. Giants that are in their own life. How can we be expected to fight for the, for, the, for the entirety if we can't defeat what's right there in our own backyard? David. Dave, the only reason David su- survived is because of his humility. He said, I'm a man of unclean hands. God, I sinned. Some of you have been dealing with the symptoms that we mentioned with in, 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 in adult Sunday school. If I could just put it this way for the giants, you're dealing with trying to take care of things from the outside in and you're concealing things that is going to destroy you once you think you're safe. Paul said, I lay myself on the altar as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. I wonder if we could take a moment. Can, can we pray? I'm going to quote Proverbs 16, 6, 16 through 19. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold, to get understanding, to be chosen than silver? The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth the way, his way preserveth his soul. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Come on, somebody begin to pray. God, forgive us of our sins. God, help us, Lord, to rise up in our lives. Wash us by your blood. Cleanse us white as snow. God, we want to be called after your own heart, Lord. Uh, We want to be people that uh, know how to pray, not just in uh, enforcement, not just in the executive power, God, uh, that we use in the services, but in our own lives, God, uh, in our personal lives, uh, for our families, uh, that we'll stand against the giants that will try to come against our children, our families, our extended families, uh, our co-workers, uh, those people that we're around every day, God, uh, the person that's trying to give us our our food in the drive through God. Help us, Lord, to be people who intercede, that know how to get into prayer, that know how to pray God to see things happen. Come on, come against that giant. You're not meant to lose, you're meant to win. Come against that giant. You're more than a conqueror. Stop cowering before the giant. Step up to the plate. Step up and say, God, here I am. In the name of Jesus, I will win. In the name of Jesus, I will win.
<laughs> we walk by faith, not by sight. Don't look at your opposition. We walk by faith, not by sight. Don't look into his eyes. Just pray against him in the name of Jesus. We walk by faith, not by sight. Begin to exercise the power that God has given you in your life. I mean, be bold if you don't open your mouth. You've already been in a defeated state. You've got to pray. You've got to pray against these things. You've got to come against these things. There's a time for meditation. There's a time in, in meditating on His Word and, and, and listening to His voice. And we've heard the Lord been speaking to us about these giants for a while. But there's got to be something inside of you that said, God, I, I humble myself. I'm tired of this. I'm exhausted by the giants in my life. I want to rise up and stand in Your righteousness, God. Oh, hallelujah. Let me make sure I'm clear about David. He made it right with God. What did David do after sinning? He repented of his sins. He, he, he accepted the forgiveness of God in his life. And let me share the encouraging word of what he did after that. Because it's not enough for us just to repent and get it out of our life. 2 Samuel 21 records what he did after he actually got done with getting his life right, his mind right, his heart right with God. He went back to war against the giants. He said, I cannot be idle I'm going to fight with my brethren. 2 Samuel 21, 15 says, Moreover, the Philistines had not yet war again with Israel. And David went down with his servants and fought against the Philistines. Oh, come on. Somebody needs to rise up. Stop using excuses. Somebody needs to rise up. So you made a mess in your life. Turn it around. Get it behind you. And it says, David, even in his age that he was, he waxed faint. And Ishbi Benab, which was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, secured him, smote the Philistine, and killed him. Oh, you're not seeing it. We're in this together. We're in this together. When you're weak, I can be strong. When I'm weak, you can be strong. But we got to get out into the field and do the work that God's called us to do. And the men of David swear unto him, be, Thou shalt be, go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sheb Shebekai, the, the Hushuathite, slew Saph, which was one of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in God with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of somebody, the Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And yet there was yet a battle in Gath where the men of great stature, stature had on every hand six fingers and every foot six, six toes, four and twenty in number. He was also born of, to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were the born of the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God is taking us somewhere. It's not going to be flesh and blood like this, but there are principalities and powers of darkness over the air, over the Black Hills, over Rapid City, over this area. And he's asking, will there be anyone that will rise up, that will rise up and say, I'm going to go to prayer. I'm going to take down strongholds. I'm going to stand in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray like I've never prayed before. For. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take my sword of the Spirit and I'm going to begin to do paddle like I've never done before. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Rise up! Rise up! Rise up! 
Can we stand? Oh, hallelujah. I'm asking you right now, scripturally, 1 Peter 5 and 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty, mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Oh, God, we pray. There's a work to be done. Oh, God. Oh, God, there's a work to be done. Individually, in every workplace, there's a work to be done. Individually, in every home, there's a work to be done. God, there are children that don't know you that need to know you, God. There's a work to be done. God, may we get into a position of prayer, praying that your will would be done in our lives. Let me prophesy to someone right now. And let me tell you what my practice has been, my wife and I together. We, we've got, we've got, I had to get ready for two sermons today. I got, I got Bible study on Tuesday, church on Wednesday, church on Thursday. But you know what? You, you have to have the mindset. God, if you give me a door, then you're going to trust me with that door. Sister, when you said, hey, we got a free space down there for, for a year, we can, we can arrange on Thursday nights, Lord, any giants? Here I am, Lord. Any giants? Is there someone, is there someone down there that, that, that's lost, that, that they can't just drive here? Let's go to them. Let's battle for hot springs. Let's pray for hot springs. Let's pray, God, there's someone down there. If you'll just let the light be on in that room uh, and let them just see the glory of your kingdom by us being there. In Rapid City, when we have our Bible studies on Tuesday, we have people, you know, it just sometimes we have a full room. Let's be available. And when God opens the door, don't say, well, I don't know if this is God. If it's serving God, it's not your flesh. Your flesh is what's stopping you from the, going through the door. Let me simplify it. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, there's water. But your flesh may be stopping you from going through that door. I want to encourage you, if you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, if you've never had your sins washed away, the baptismal's ready. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can get the Holy Ghost today. Jesus said you must be born again of water and of spirit. And if you've already had those happen, God is saying, army, rise up. Will you step into your role? Will you step into my identity that I've given you? Will you be everything that I've called you to be? Would you stop making excuses? And will you say, yes, Lord, here I am. Hallelujah, I am a servant of you, God. I will respond. If anyone knows how to do that, it's got to be our military guys. You say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am to people. I don't even know if you say that anymore. But you say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am to those that are authority over you that you may not have an ounce of respect for, but you have respect for your rank and their rank. But here we are saying yes, sir, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is a conquering God. He is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. So you need not question his authority. Can you pray? Does anybody say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord, here I am. Do you need me to go in to fight? Do you need me to do your will? Here I am, God. Hallelujah. Here I am, God. Send me, Lord. Oh, send me, God. God.